All right, welcome to the Committee on Education. Sorry for the delay. You know we're in that hurry up and wait mode um, and uh, trying to get everything to work. So we appreciate you being here. Um, don't know if this is our last meeting or not, <laughs> um, but uh, we, uh, we have a meeting. Um, and uh, want to welcome you uh, to the meeting today. If the Secretary will take the roll. Vice Chair Don Darlou, Senator Hardy. Senator Hammond, Senator Lang, yeah. Senator Buck, yeah. Senator Dignate, yeah. Chair Dennis. Here, thank you. Um, and I know we haven't had this many people in one room at one time at any of our four meetings, but to, um, just a reminder on the the uh, um, electronics, if you you know turn those to silent or 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 uh, vibrate, and um, we will take. Uh, testimony in support, neutral and opposition of bills today, and then at the end we'll also have public comment. Um, so with that, um, I think that that's it. So we're going to just go, and I'm just going to follow uh, in order the bills that are on here. Um, and uh, so we're going to start first with AB 156 which revises provisions governing the waiver by the Board of Regents of the University of Nevada of certain fees for active members of the Nevada National Guard. And I believe Assemblywoman Titus is here. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair of the Education Committee, Chair Dennis, and members of the Education Committee, um, I am Assemblywoman uh, Robin Titus, and I represent District 38, which is all of Churchill County and most of Lyon County. Um, for, um, Assembly Bill 156 revises provisions governing the waiver by the Board of Regents of the University of Nevada of certain fees for active members of the Nevada National Guard. I did have with me, but don't know, um, Colonel uh, Jerome um, Guerrero, who was the Deputy Chief of Staff of Personnel. He, he approached me almost two years ago regarding this bill. Uh, and so um, hopefully we can move forward here. In 2005, Senate Bill 78 made permanent the fee waiver program for active members of the Nevada National Guard attending a school as either a full or part-time student in the Nevada System of Education, or NG. This program allows active Guard members to register for courses without a registration, without um, for registration for, for classes. What this bill does is allow them to offer that waiver to a family member. Behind the, what he would have said if he was here was that they came up with this on uh, trying to figure out a way to have uh, National Guard folks re-enlist in the National Guard after their first term of six years. What they have understood is that if somebody re-enlists from that six-year to that ten-year period, then they will tend to stay in the National Guard and make that their 20-year commitment. Where they're losing guardsmen is after that first tour with the guards. And the cost to keep these guardsmen there or train the new people coming in was where the significant amount of monies were. So one, in one of their leadership meetings, they came up with a plan to offer their guards as a little carrot, their guardsmen, let's say, hey, you haven't used your education stipend. We will, if you re-up, and, and it's only if they re-enlist in the National Guard, we will allow you to give that education commitment to one family member, but only while you're active and only if you're re-enlist. So this is um, a commitment that we've already made to them, so it's not like they both get it. So it's either or, so it's not an additional, now you're having two, fa two people get this uh, education waiver. It's simply to, for one person um, at, in lieu of the National Guardsmen themselves as that key for them re-enlisting. And with that, that pretty much exp uh, explains the bill, and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Okay, we're at that time of session. <laughs> everybody, we're at that time where everybody has read it all and has it memorized and has had all their answers, uh, questions answered. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, do you have anybody else other than you? No, I, like I, I, as I explained earlier, I had the colonel and he's been on and off and finally said, I have to go do something. I said, right. I got it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. So anyone wishing, so let us go to anyone wishing to give 
um, public comment in support of the bill, uh, or to public testimony in support of the bill. Anybody in the room? Okay. Um, anybody online? If BPS can uh, put them on. Thank you, Chair. If you'd like to testify in support on AB 156, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Okay, before we go to the next one, um, I believe Senator Donate had a, had a question. So let's ask that first and then we'll go on to the, those in opposition. Thank you so much. Um, Assembly Moment, I just have a really, really quick and simple question. Um, the bill applies, and I'm looking at the very, very first section in terms of a uh, spouse or child of an associate's degree, baccalaureate degree, or a certificate. Is there any reason why graduate school was left out, or was that a consideration? We, we mirrored this bill off of what we already offer the National Guardsmen, and it just expanded that to a family member. So we didn't expand what the potential cost was to and she itself, and so that's how we mirrored this bill. Thank you so much. Oh, Senator Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It just took a second to kind of get through some of the stuff, but uh, uh, in reading it, I want to make sure I understand this part of the policy. Um, uh, this is, again, in Section 1, uh, 2, um, subsection B, down at the bottom, where it reads, for each period of reenlistment of a member, the benefit provided pursuant to this subsection may only be used by one eligible person. So what you're saying here in a sense is that every time you re-enlist, and a re-enlistment period I believe is five to six years, um, then, then basically you can hand it off to somebody else. So in that five year period, somebody could graduate and then if you re-enlist, then another person in your family is then eligible or you are potentially eligible. Uh, am I correct? Um, <laughs> So uh, the way I read it and the way I underst understand it is it's still that it would be the same way that would be if you're re-enlisting each time you have education benefits, those don't go away and then you could, you could assign them to somebody else. Um, now whether or not you could assign them to three or four different people, no one has asked that and we could ask a legal on that one. Um, that, hadn't, that question hadn't come up before, Senator. And Robin Titus for the record. I would like to know that. That would be, that'd be okay. good. Let's ask Mr. Uh, Asher or Mr. Killian if you would, um, can you answer that question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Asher Killian, Committee Council. Yes, as that language reads right now, um, for each period of reenlistment, the benefit can only be assigned to one person. So if there were multiple periods of reenlistment, each of those periods, the benefit could be assigned to only a single person, but to different people um, each period. Does that answer your question? It, it does. Thank you very much, Mr. Killian. I think that answers my question. And thank you, uh, uh, Assemblywoman. I think that, that that answers my question as well. I think it, so. Basically, as long as that person is, you know, serving and giving their commitment to the country, then basically they can continue to give it to a family member. Okay. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just for further clarification, they could keep that themselves, too, if, as long as they're active. From what I understand, I don't know that there's a commitment. Maybe you could clarify the yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Killian. I see a head bob, so thank you. It, it, and with that, so if you kept you, it, Chair. does that mean that you could actually go? I'm sorry, this is uh, Senator Hammond. It, does that mean that, uh, I think going back to Senator Donate's question, you know, if you re-enlist, you still wouldn't be able to go to graduate school with it, though? Uh, or did I hit it wrong? I'll, I'll turn to our attorney on that, but if I might, Robin Titus, for the record, because, uh, again, I do not know what the law states for enlisted National Guardsmen, whether they could use it if, you know, if they haven't graduated or if there's an end date on how many semesters it takes. You know, if you're still taking one class a semester and you're there for 30 years and you're still taking one class, I, I don't know. So maybe some clarification would be helpful. Mr. Killian, is that something? I think she's, a, she's a addressing what currently is in statute. And what this bill does is just is basically just giving the ability for a family member to get that same benefit. So the question had to do with graduate school. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, Asher Kelly and Media Council. Um, and so to respond to Senator Hammond's first question, um, for each period of reenlistment, the benefit would only be able to be used by one person. So if the member um, member of the National Guard chooses to use it for himself, they can't also have a family member use it. It would just be either for themselves or for the one other family member. And then as to the undergraduate versus graduate work distinction, um, the existing law actually doesn't specify um, what level of instruction is allowed for this benefit. I think it may be in practice that it's only used for um, undergraduate work currently, but the new language would specify for any family member that the benefit is transferred to you. Um, that it would only be used for associate's degree or baccalaureate degree or certificate work, so only for undergraduate work. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yep. Similar, um, Titus, um, would this be only for dependent dependents? Right, it's pretty specific. That language is clear in here on who would possibly be uh, wait, his spouse or child for credits applicable to workhorse um, and spouse or child. And also, um, and no one has asked this, and, and it would have been presented by, by the colonel um, on who's going to report to the Board of Regents, and so the so adjunct general will keep a strict list on which person has assigned it and how that works so they understand who actually benefited from this and how many did we actually get to reenlist because of this program. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's... Um, Brief, well, let's go back um, since we did this right after. Let's just go back real quick. Anybody, because maybe something that was said changed somebody's mind and they want to come up and support. Um, anybody here in the room that wants to come and give testimony and support? I'm not seeing anybody. And uh, uh, let's go online one more time and support BPS. Thank you, Chair. If you'd like to testify in support on AB 156, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. Let's go to those wishing to give uh, testimony in opposition. Anybody here in the room? Not seeing anyone. Um, so let's go online, see if anyone wishes to give testimony in opposition. If you'd like to testify in opposition on AB 156, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Let's go. Anyone wishing to give testimony in neutral? Here in the room, no one's coming forward. Um, let's go online. If you'd like to testify in neutral on AB 156, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Okay, uh, so we'll go ahead and close the public testimony on AB 156, I think we have um, some additional questions. Um, Senator Lang, do you still have a question? Oh, you're good, okay. Anybody else? All right, then we'll, um, any, any closing comments? Okay, thank you very much. So we'll go ahead and close the, oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna go. We're go um, uh, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB 156. Um, we're going to wait. Oh, we're going to hear the bills first, and then we'll come back to do work session. All right. Thank you very much. Let's go to um, AB 165, which revises provisions governing tuition for veterans. Assemblywoman Hardy. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis um, and members of the Senate Education Committee. For the record, I am Melissa Hardy representing Assembly District 22 in Clark County. I am pleased to have the opportunity to present Assembly Bill 165 before you today, which represents a key tool in supporting our military veterans. This bill comes before you today um, as a recommendation from the United Veterans Legislative Council 
and I'm honored to sponsor it. The Nevada Legislature has a record of proactively addressing student veterans' transition issues. The various pieces of legislation passed by this body demonstrates our support to veterans, active members of the armed forces, and their dependents. Um, so this is why I'm proud to introduce AB 165, which removes the five-year limitation on assessing tuition charges against honorably discharged veterans. Additionally, the bill prohibits the Board of Regents from assessing a tuition charge against all veterans who are honorably discharged. Our military veterans give us so much. They risk their own lives and sacrifice time with families, good pay, and a safe working environment in order to allow us to feel safe at home, including a time frame in which they must pursue higher education following their service, assumes our veterans know what path they would like to take upon leaving the military. However, it takes time to transition from the military world to the civilian world, to the academic world. We owe them this time. Our veterans deserve the opportunity to come home and have access to quality higher education so they can pursue their post-military goals whenever they are ready. We can provide it, and Nevada can and will become their place of opportunity. Um, I think this bill will go a long way towards keeping more um, Nevadans working in our state, raising our families here, and taking advantage of the high quality, high paying jobs for which Nevada has long been known. So that um, concludes my remarks on this bill, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Do you have anybody else that's giving testimony? No, I had some um, in the other hearing, but with the flexibility of our schedules, it was <laughs> kind of a lot to ask for them to hang out all day. Anything that, that they would have said that, uh, that you didn't cover? Um, I would have just, I had um, Mr. Tony Yarbrough, he's the secretary with the United um, Veterans Legislative Council, um, and you know, he was very supportive, like I said, this was one of their um, top recommendations that they wanted to see passed. So um, he was with, was with me, and I so also had Byron Brooks, who was a veteran, um, and he's helped me work a lot of veterans' issues, and um, he's also on the Board of Regents, but he was just testifying um, as a veteran and in support of this bill as well. Great, thank you. So do we have any questions? Senator Hammond? I think the question that would be great, to, and I think you know the answer already, and I think most of us do, um, the reason, the rationale, right? So in the bill, uh, it basically, the, the only thing the bill does is delete the five-year uh, requirement. And, and so um, if you could elaborate a little bit more, I, I suspect it's, it's because a lot of them come back, uh, the service folks coming back, they've got to get jobs, they're supporting families. It's hard to get through the university um, experience uh, in five years, if you're just, even if you're just doing it full time. But if you could just tell us a little bit about why that is necessary and perhaps in the future what, what you're kind of anticipating, that'd be great. I think just for the record, I, I, I didn't hear that before, so maybe I missed it. Sure, um, Melissa Hardy for the record. And you're exactly right. Um, you know, many of us that haven't been in the, in the military sometimes don't know what path we want to take. And as, as I stated, it's an adjustment to come out of the military and, and to know what you want to do. You know, maybe you, you've, you need to find a job and support your family, or um, you just don't know what interests you yet. And it's five years, that's a short time, I feel, to decide that. And maybe you start a career and you decide that you want to change or you want to, um, you know, do something different and want to pursue some other education. And so it, it may take somebody six years or it may take somebody 15 years and so I just feel um, that, you know, we, we owe them that time. They sacrifice and, and give so much for us and for our country. And, you know, I, I feel honestly it's the least that we could do to support these veterans and, and whatever they choose to do in their future when they come home. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go to... Um, and actually, I do have one question. Um, so based on that last discussion, you're removing the five-year, but does that give it an unlimited? So someone that was discharged 40 years ago could use it? Melissa Hardy, for the record, correct. 
so yeah, you know, anytime someone that's 50 or 60 years old, maybe they've never been been to college or whatever, they could to choose to do that. Okay. All right. Um, Senator Lang. So I, I'm looking in the bill, and I was just wondering, does this um, only apply to like four-year colleges or five-year, you know, or does it, could someone go to, um, um, I forget the word I'm looking for, but, you know, to any kind of training? Yes, Melissa Hardy for the record. Yeah, it would be any NSHE institution. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Let's go then to those wishing to give testimony in support. Uh, anyone here in the room? Anybody? Okay, I don't see anybody coming up. Uh, anybody um, online wishing to give um, public testimony in support of AB 165? If we could, BPS, if we could put them on the line. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in support on AB 165, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 747, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Once again, caller Chair with the and last committee three members. Members. Yes, thank you, caller. Please proceed. Chair and committee members, my name is Andrew LaPelbet. Last name, L-E-P-E-I-L-B-E-T. And I represent the combat wounded veterans of the Purple Heart in the state of Nevada, the 65,000 disabled American veterans in the state of Nevada. And I am the current chair of the United Veterans Legislative Council, representing 250,000 veterans and their families, 500, that when you include their families, 500,000 Nevadans. We, in, we are fully in support of AB 165. It's been a request from our our uh, veterans and our guard members that have gotten out of the service. And like has already been said by the assemblywoman, we, they takes a while to get reoriented, especially some of our guard members that have been on these multiple tours of duty overseas in foreign lands. So the United Veterans Legislative Council is in support of passing AB 165. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next caller in support. Once again, if you'd like to testify in support on AB 165, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Okay, thank you. Let's go. Anyone wishing to give uh, testimony in opposition here in the room um, or online? Let's go to online. Thank you, Chair. If you'd like to testify in opposition on AB 165, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Let's go to anyone wish to give testimony in neutral on this bill here in the room. Okay, no one here. Let's go to, um, let's go online. If you'd like to testify in neutral on AB 165, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and close the public testimony. Um, any other additional questions that anyone has? Any final comments? Okay, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB 165 and we will open the hearing on AB 225. Um, Woman Tolls. Welcome. 
Thank you so much, Chair. Wonderful to see you and members of this esteemed education committee. My name is Jill Tolls. I represent Assembly District 25, and it is my distinct pleasure to bring before you Assembly Bill 225. I'd like to start with sharing a little bit of the story of the inspiration behind this bill, give you a little bit more of the background and the research behind this um, proposal, and then walk through the bill briefly, which as you can see is pretty short. So um, first let me start with uh, most of my legislation comes oftentimes from a really um, good personal story and one was when I ran into some old acquaintances about a year and a half ago at a memorial service and caught up on what they were doing, a, a couple that I had known years ago. And the husband said, you know, late in my life at the age of 60, I found my calling in life. It turns out that I love to teach. And he had been um, substitute teaching for the past two years. And he was um, almost done with his master's degree. He was getting straight A's, but he was frustrated because he has a slight learning disability that was um, creating a barrier for him in being able to take the licensure exam. And so I made a phone call to some people that I knew in the Department of Education, and they worked with him and found an accommodation um, that still demonstrated that he was more than willing and capable of teaching. In fact, his principal couldn't wait to hire him full time, um, but he just needed that accommodation to be able to um, get his licensure and teach in the classroom. And I'm happy to say that he not only graduated with his master's degree top of his class, and he um, did get his license. He has been teaching for the last year, and it's been an incredible experience for him and the students that are blessed enough to have him in the classroom. But it occurred to me that you shouldn't have to know someone that um, to make a, a phone call, that this really should be something that we need to take a look at as a state, particularly when we talk about the importance of diversity in our education workforce and in our schools. And so I did a little bit more research, and what I found is that 26% of Nevadans have some form of physical, mental, or developmental disability. It's estimated that one in five children and adults have a learning disability. And as Emma Thompson once said, being disabled should not mean being disqualified from having access to every aspect of life. These statistics do not have to be a determination of failure or success. And it, oftentimes with the right accommodations, we can see both our students and adults reach their personal and professional goals. AB 64 in the 2017 session was the first time, and as some might know, not the last time that I've cried in the middle of an education uh, committee hearing. Um, it was a bill that created a pathway for pupils with disabilities to demonstrate proficiency in the standards of content and performance in order to receive their diploma. And I will never forget Will Jensen, the director of the Office of Inclusive Education, quoting one of my favorite movies, Temple Grandin, when he talked about how it's important to recognize that students with disabilities are different, not less. Joey Riemann, in um, reflecting on the Paralympics, once said, what I learned was that these athletes were not disabled. They were super enabled. They, the, the Olympics is where heroes are made. The Paralympics is where heroes come. So where do teachers fit into this equation? Well, according to figures from the Department of Education, less than 1% of the teaching profession has a disability or self-reports. These statistics may not give the full picture as not everyone admits to being disabled when completing the forms, but it certainly speaks to a gap that we have in that diversified workforce. Like the Paralympic athletes, research has shown that often teachers with disabilities can be super abled in the classroom. In Teachers with Disabilities, a literature review published in the International Journal of Inclusive Education, they found that in relation to educational practices, some studies, particularly those involving teachers with dyslexia and learning disabilities, uh, described the specific strategies that teachers developed to interact with students in the classroom. 
Examples include teachers with learning disabilities favoring oral and visual communication using figures, drawings, among others to discuss relevant topics in the classroom in order to overcome spelling, oral, memory, or organizational difficulties. Preparing classes in advance, including the rehearsal of lessons, instead of spontaneous writing on the board, encouraging students to engage and carrying with them dictionaries or spell checkers, these strategies reflected the strong commitment of these teachers to develop innovative and creative ways of teaching in many cases, reflecting their own personal experience. As one teacher stated in the article, the advantage of disadvantage, teachers with disabilities are not a handicap. I have a one up on anyone who can walk because I can see what my students need and I can see the struggles they're facing. She says, somebody who isn't disabled, they can read about it, they can watch it, but if they never live through it, they never really know. So what does AB 225 do to address this? Well, first I'd like to thank the Department of Education for working with me on the proposed language you see here before you in the first reprint that I would note passed unanimously out of the assembly with broad bipartisan and bicameral co-sponsorship support. This bill seeks to expand our ABLE teaching workforce by requiring the Commission on Professional Standards in Education to adopt regulations to consider alternative means of demonstrating competency for persons with a disability or health-related need that the Commission determines are necessary and appropriate. I'd like to point out in NRS uh, 391.021, that they still have to prove competence and knowledge in the subject. And as I noted earlier, many times research has shown us that these teachers have proven to be even more effective as a result of engaging in creative strategies to teach their students and their increased empathy towards students who also have disabilities. This bill will not only open the doors of opportunity for willing and able teachers, It will set a tremendous example for our students as well. Clayton E. Keller, co-author of Enhancing Diversity, Educators with Disabilities says, districts should be actively recruiting disabled teachers. One of the things that gets talked about a lot in non-disability diversity is are the images of people like me? Are there people like me in positions of responsibility? Keller says, if kids with disabilities don't see people with disabilities in positions of responsibility, will they think they'll ever be able to do those things as well? I'd like to leave you with one last thought, and that is in a class that I teach on organizational communication. I will never forget when I came across um, a certain term that was a bit of a spinoff of the glass ceiling. We talked a lot about the glass ceiling um, in, in, in this body and over the years, and that concept of being able to see through to the next level, but not being able to break through it. What really struck me one day was when I came across the concept of the concrete ceiling. And the concrete ceiling speaks to when we can't even see an example of anything that's gone, of anyone that looks like us or is like us who's gone before us. I believe that we have a tremendous opportunity here to not only expand our teaching workforce with future educators who are willing and more than able to teach, but also to inspire the next generation to overcome challenges and succeed in their future career goals and life. And so with that, I'd like to finish my opening remarks and also note that hopefully we have um, Michael Arakawa from the Department of Education who can help answer any technical questions for you as well. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Do we have some questions? I'll I'll ask one. Um, Can you talk about Um, has this, I mean, it, is this something that's currently already available and you're just clarifying it or can you talk about that? Go ahead. Yes, thank you. And, and can we confirm that we do have someone from NDE just in case 
We do. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting the, the verbal shake of the head. Yes. So, um, so currently through the, the Praxis exam, there are certain accommodations that are already built into the, to the system. However, um, they don't cover all the potential accommodations. And so, um, for example, in, um, in, you know, the, the example of the teacher that I told you about, uh, they were able to find a, an alternative way of demonstrating um, that competence by completing certain courses um, and, and other ways for him to demonstrate that he was um, competent in being able to teach in that, in that coursework. And, um, and then I'll let NDE talk about some other examples so of um, how putting this into statute directs that um, we will actively engage in coming up with these kinds of solutions um, for teachers who can seek these uh, alternative means of demonstrating competence. Thanks. Okay, it looks like we have someone here from NDE. Is that Mr. Ar Ar Arkawa? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Mike Ar for the record. Uh, as Assemblywoman Toll said, uh, the intent here is simply to find some alternatives for individuals whose needs may not be properly accommodated by the existing accommodations within the testing process. Uh, as a further example, I spoke with an individual who has a traumatic brain injury and has difficulty with memorization, uh, which is not something that makes it easy to go and sit down and take an exam to demonstrate competency. So, you know, in a case like that, uh, we're, it is our hope that the commission can come up with some alternatives to the exam that would reflect uh, that individual's competency in a way that actually works for them. So, so would this bring consistency in how you handle that situation? Uh, for the record, Mike, Hart, the yes, it would through the creation of regulations around what sorts of uh, different allowances might be acceptable. So currently, you don't have regs concerning that. You just kind of just do it on a need basis. Is that correct? For the record, Mike Arakawa, indeed, that is correct. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Any other uh, Senator Hammond? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think my line of question would be the same as yours, to be honest with you. I think that I think we're hitting the same thing, and that is, you know, when you read the, the NRS right now, the one that you pointed out, uh, Assemblywoman 391.021, uh, the commission, uh, they're tasked with making sure that the examinations test the ability of the applicant. Uh, to teach in the applicant's knowledge of each specific subject he or she proposes to teach. But now what you're asking, that you're tasking uh, NDE with, is coming up with methods of doing it. Um, my concern, I think, is the same as the chair, and that is now you're tasking with that. I mean, there's, a, a, I don't know, a, a lot of different combinations of tests that you may not actually be able to come up with all of them. So I would imagine that as you're coming up with the regulations, what I'm going to be looking for when we're in the Ledge Commission is, have you come up with regulations that would then not only point to some specifics in some cases, so there's conformity uh, and continuity, but also leaving it a little bit broad so that you might be able to put more in later on. Uh, so that, you know, you're kind of giving us a, hey, this is what we're looking for so we understand what the objective is. Obviously, the objective is to make sure we're testing somebody's capabilities, but that's kind of what I was, I would hope that that's what we're going to get with Ledge Commission. Is that, am I, that's not really a question, but I'm hoping that you might be able to say that's kind of the same thing we're thinking of. Thank you, um, Chair, through you to uh, Senator Hammond. Thank you so much for um, bringing that up, and I think that's really important to have that on re on record, um, that that would be the intent, that you know we want to be careful that it's not so prescriptive that it's limiting, um, but also that it does, um, you know, it, it does provide some, some guidelines to move forward um, in, in the case, and hopefully um, the gentleman that I was referring to is uh, he is waiting online to share his story as well. Um, but he, he would tell you that his specific accommodation was a, a spell check and um, that wasn't available. So can you know, but that's something that he didn't need to teach math that necessarily and that he could use that accommodation teaching in the classroom. But yet that barrier to overcome to be able to get into the classroom to teach, um, you know, was, was something that was holding back a perfectly willing and able teacher. And so it would be to, um, you know, to make sure that we keep it um, not, not so limited that it would, uh, you know, 
be more of a barrier. Um, the other thing that I will say is just in the course of having these conversations with uh, the Department of Education and even reaching out to um, NSHE, um, it's spurred on a lot more action of recognizing where we need to be actively promoting um, and recruiting and letting individuals out there know that uh, hopefully with these regulations, these accommodations, there are alternative ways of demonstrating that competency in order to get that licensure so that that message is out there that this, this doesn't have to be a barrier. You, you do can enter the teaching workforce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go to those wishing to give testimony and support. If you're here, if you'll come, those in the room, come forward. We do have some here, so we'll, we won't go online just yet. We'll do the ones here in the room first. When you're ready, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Chair. For the record, Lindsay Anderson on behalf of the Washoe County School District. I'm here in support of Assembly Bill 225. I don't think there's much left to say um, that Assemblywoman Tolls didn't cover uh, except to acknowledge that our district is working very hard to have teachers uh, that reflect our student population. Uh, and we certainly, um, special education teachers are some of our most difficult to fill positions. Uh, and if these uh, individuals can demonstrate competency, we would like them in the classroom with our students. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Chairman Dennis and committee members. My name is Kenny Belknap, and I'm the acting secretary and board member of the Clark County Education Association. CCEA supports AB 225, and we thank Assemblywoman Tolls for bringing this bill forward. We need to make accommodations for people with a disability that have proven academic success in the past, but may not be able to successfully demonstrate competency in the traditional assessment format. We need to diversify the education profession and do whatever we can to attract individuals with high academic aptitude who want to be in the profession. Providing an alternative means of demonstrating competency does not make the individual any less successful or knowledgeable about the profession, instead allowing potential educators the opportunity to, de to demonstrate knowledge in a content area through performance-based methods or, al or alternative methods will enable all, all types of learners an opportunity, to, a top an opportunity to demonstrate competency without lowering the standards to enter the profession. Diversifying the teaching profession must be a pri priority, especially as we face issues with teacher retention. Allowing testing alternatives will be a, uh, be a step in supporting diversity, will help address the teaching shorting, shortage crisis, excuse me, and we will uh, help destigmatize learning accommodations for students once they have teachers who represent their same needs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Brad Keating, for the record, representing uh, the Clark County School District. We are happy to be here in support of this bill today. Um, I had the privilege and honor of teaching a uh, group of students with disabilities uh, for a number of years at West Career and Technical Academy, students that were 18 to 22 years old that came back after receiving uh, their diploma, and we worked on uh, workforce skills and got them ready for employment. Uh, this bill that's before you today is a perfect example of something that will help those students that I taught every single day become successful and productive members of society. Uh, these are students, uh, these students with disabilities have extraordinary abilities when given the opportunity and I hope that each of you will uh, push that green button and give them the chance to continue uh, in their success moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Eric Jimenez, for the record, I don't often testify in a personal capacity, uh, but as one of the 26% of Nevadans living with a disability, I think I have a responsibility sometimes to support good policy when it helps our disability community. Traditionally, uh, we've talked a lot about diversity over the last few sessions. Unfortunately, for many years, that diversity hasn't trickled down into the classroom. With the leadership of Tyrone Thompson and the Department of Education through Assembly uh, Bill 64, I think Senator Hammond uh, worked on that back then, we did a lot to make sure that kids had a pathway in the classroom so we were no longer dealing with segregated classrooms where kids with disabilities had to learn in a separate environment. We have worked tirelessly across the government throughout these last four years to make sure that those kids had an opportunity to learn in the same classroom. I think this is the next logical step in making sure that kids in those classrooms can see people who look like them and make sure um, that they can do anything. And I think, you know, just as someone who grew up with a disability, there was never anybody that looked like me um, in those classrooms. And I just want to thank my friend from Assembly District 25 uh, for always leading on these issues. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, Elliot Mallon, um, mm -hmm. and I have the unfortunate of honor having to follow that up uh, because Mr. Jimenez always knocks mm -hmm. it out of the park. Um, last session, Assemblywoman Tolls and I had the uh, privilege and honor to work together on a bill about restoring opportunity to Nevadans. Um, at the beginning of this session, the Assemblywoman called me and said, Elliot, I have a bill that I think you'll be interested in. And I said, Assemblywoman, tell me what it is. And she got a, a sentence in and I said, let me stop you, I'm in, whatever you need me to do, because this is gonna help Nevadans, this is gonna help Nevada's school children, um, and this is gonna restore our opportunity to people that didn't have it. And I think that that is the most incredible thing and why we're all here. And I also wanna make a mention really fast, uh, oftentimes I too don't like to uh, testify in a personal capacity. When I was in high school, I had the opportunity to have a teacher who taught me to always do whatever we could to help others. And for the first time ever, that teacher is actually in this room today. Um, Mr. Frazee back there. So I think it's really cool that this all uh, came full circle. So thank you, and I agree with Mr. Jimenez. Please pass this bill. Thank you. It's always great to have good teachers, right, that influence our lives. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Adler, Silver State Government Relations. Today, proud to represent the Charter School Association of Nevada. CSAN is also glad and excited that this bill has come forward. I myself was a high school teacher for many years, and there are a lot of kids that I think could have developed a passion for teaching, but knew that they were terrible test takers. They proved it to me a few times, uh, but that didn't mean that they didn't have knowledge and ability. So we're in full support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here in the room? Okay, let's go online. Anyone wishing to give testimony and support online? Thank you, Chair. If you'd like to testify in support on AB 225, please, uh, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Thank you. Caller with the last three digits, 692, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis and Vice Chair Don darrow Loop. For the record, my name is Mary Przinski, M-A-R-Y-P-I-E-R-C-Z-Y-N-F-K-I, and I'm here representing Nevada Association of School Superintendents. And we supported AB 225 in the Assembly Education after hearing a very compelling story that was the impetus for this bill. We do not want to miss any talented, competent people who want to be teachers. And we're in full support of this bill that's going to allow for that and to help us with our teacher shortage. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, lend our support this afternoon. Thank you. We can go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 117. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and you may begin. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Wheeler, um, K-E-G-I-N-W-H-E-E-L-E-R. Um, I'm a little bit cracking up a little bit because um, I happen to be the one that uh, that spoke to Jill Tolls under the circumstances that, that brought this all about. and. I'm in full support of this bill. Um, I've been a teacher in the Washington County School District uh, for the last year and a half. I work at Demonte Ranch High School as a special education teacher in the social intervention program. Um, and uh, the, I can't say anything more than that primarily the things have been said, except that, uh, that uh, this bill needs to pass so that, that others don't have to accidentally run into somebody that they've known for, you know, years past at a, at a memorial service in order to, to be able to, to become teachers. My students, I have, I have uh, parents who have literally been in tears over the, um, my being willingness, uh, being willing to, to tell my, uh, my testimony to them about how, um, 
I, uh, what I tell them is, is that I'm the world's second worst speller because I may run into somebody who could spell worse than me one day. So I just leave that slot open. But um, the kids get a big joke out of it. But parents are appreciative and kids are as well because they understand that I, um, I personally know what they're going through to a greater extent than most of their other teachers. And, and I can also tell them that that's no excuse just because you have a disability. There's always a way to win. And we just need to find out what works for them. And uh, numerous parents have already, in my short time as a, as a licensed teacher for a year and a half, have come to me and, and told me how much they appreciate that. I also know uh, several other people who have tried to become teachers in, in the Washoe County School District and uh, have been unsuccessful in doing so because they didn't have the appropriate accommodation for the testing portion of that um, to, to pass one particular part of the practice core because of a specific learning disability similar to mine. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to, uh, to get on board with this uh, legislation. I, I can't say how much it will level the playing field, not only for me, not only for people like me, but also for my students coming up. Um, one in particular wanted to go into uh, education and didn't think she could ever do it. Mom didn't think she could ever do it because of her disability. And uh, now they see that there's a possibility just simply because I'm allowed to be in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. Uh, let's go to those wishing to give testimony in opposition. Anyone here in the room? Anyone, there's no one here in the room, anybody online? If you would like to testify in opposition, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Okay, thank you. Let's go to those wishing to testimony in neutral. Anyone here in the room? Let's go online, anyone online. If you would like to testify in neutral, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Once again, if you'd like to testify in neutral on AB 225, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Sure, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and then close the the uh, hearing uh, or, or the uh, testimony on AB two two five. Any final comments? Some movement tolls. Thank you so much, Chair and members of this committee, Assemblywoman Jill Tolls, for the record. And um, I do just want to say that this is for um, teaching any class, not just um, classes for students with di disabilities and for both physical and um, learning and mental disabilities. And um, I, I also want to point out, I, I forgot to mention, I gave a, a copy of a article from TMCC talking about Mr. Kevin Wheeler's 35 year journey to um, where he is today and that is posted on Nellis for anyone in the public that wanted to read more about his story. We're so proud of his journey and this bill really is about, it's about access, it's about inspiring the next generation with an increasingly inclusive workforce and um, I just urge your support. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. With that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB 225 and open the hearing on AB 247. Similar with Benitez Thompson, it's good to have you here again. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Dennis, members of the Senate Education Committee. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. For the record, I'm Assemblywoman Teresa Benitez Thompson, representing Assembly District 27. And I'm here to present uh, Assembly Bill 247, which is the topic of WICHE, the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. So as an interstate compact, WICHE partners with states, ter territories, and post-secondary institutions to share knowledge, create resources, and develop innovative solutions to address some of our society's most pressing needs. 
since 1953, which he has been strengthening higher education, workforce development, and behavioral health throughout the region. And Nevada has been a member since 1959. Nevada's participation in the regional consortium is overseen by three commission members who are appointed by the governor. Nevada also has a small but mighty staff who's sitting next to me, comprised of Jennifer Olette, the executive director. So Wichi has essentially two different programs. First is the Professional Student Exchange Program. The Professional Student Ex Exchange Program, students receive substantial tuition support in high need fields such as pharmacy, physical therapy, and physician assistance. Students accepted into the program receive admission preference and reduced tuition cost. Students from Nevada enroll in either out of state or in out of state programs or in state private institutions. Um, 46, there were 46 students in 2020. And out-of-state tuition is reduced by a support fee, which varies by academic field and are uniformly set by the regional WICHE office. 25% um, of the support fee is a student loan, is a loan which must be paid back with interest five to 10 years after graduation. Also, 75, the other 75% of the support fee is a stipend that can be waived if the student returns to Nevada to practice for the same number of years. The rules around the 25% and the 75% are Nevada specific rules. Those are not rules that are um, dictated to us by, by WICHE. The Health Professional Exchange Program is the other program. In 1997, the Nevada legislature expanded the mission of the WICHE program by providing an option for students to receive financial support while earning graduate, um, er earning graduate degrees in social work and psychiatric nursing students. In 2020, it served 43 students, and students receive a sp support fee that's provided. So 10% of that it support fee is a repayable loan with interest. And the board did move to adopt, um, or did adopt the removal of this being a repayable loan in 2019. And the other 90% can be considered a stipend with repayment waived if that student practices for two years in a medically underserved area in Nevada. So um, the thing to note most importantly is because Nevada has been a member of Wichita since 1959, the statute has been in place since that time and really hasn't been touched. And so what Ms. Olette took on was modernizing the statute and that is the bill that we see, you see in front of you. Um, there were references to I think US territories that have changed and we had boilerplate information there that just really needed to be updated. The big policy changes that you're gonna see is that the 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 25 percent versus 75 percent of the professional student exchange program it just it wasn't working right and this day of age um, when we have uh, students who are committing to work in their field and and stay in Nevada in underserved um, areas we really just ought to be um, in the space where we are um, not having them repay that for five to ten years with interest and then the interest is stuck with a firm number in statute that's been living there for decades and so you're going to hear us make our best case for why we should just um, make this a uh, stipend that can be waived so if the student comes back and works here for the number of years they're required to then then the whole thing is waived we're not asking them to work here and then also pay off 25 percent of the loan that being said i'm in the middle of a assembly revenue um, meeting upstairs so i'm going to leave it to miss olette to kind of to walk you through the bill and answer questions that you have okay thank you in case we had any questions, I was looking, but we don't see any, so we'll have her answer. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Olette, and I am the director of the Nevada Office of the Western Interstate Commission on Higher Education. And our small chapter, NRS 397, governs Nevada's participation in the Western Regional Education Compact, which was created in 1953 and we joined in 1959. And as the majority leader mentioned, there hasn't been a lot of updates uh, since then. So 
this bill has four primary objectives, just to keep it simple. We want to remove confusion when referencing the compact and the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, which is located in Boulder, Colorado, and is not us, and then the Nevada office that participates in WICHE. And those terms are all sort of used interchangeably throughout the statute to refer to our agency. So we're trying to correct that through statute. Um, as mentioned before, a lot of our program policies, such as interest rates, payback terms, um, penalties, are set in statute. Those can't be modified without considering a, a bill such as this, and we would like to move those into regulation so that they can be updated regularly with public input as market conditions fluctuate and interest rates change. Um, we also have a problem with some of our penalties are so high that people don't pay them at all. So um, we would like to set something that is collectible and we could actually recognize that revenue. And then the last part is the loan component of our funding. So the entire goal of our program is to keep health professionals in Nevada. We fund them while they are in school and they are happy to receive our funding and in exchange when they graduate they stay in Nevada and those are usually the critical years um, where they may be meeting their life partner getting married having children establishing themselves in the state and then also making those connections in their career where they often stay longer so that our program is really good in that we are offering them an incentive to stay here but the 25% loan component has created a lot of confusion for the students. It is a significant administrative burden for staff. And Nevada is the only state out of all 10 Western states that participate in the PSEP, the WICHE PSEP program that does this. And there is a presentation online that you can look at at your leisure, but we did a survey of all the Western states that participate in this program. and. As we are the only one that has a loan component, we are also the only program that spends 70% of our staff time administering the program. All the other states spend between three and 25% of their staff time on this. So we think that by removing this, we can significantly reduce staff time. And I'm happy to answer any questions or go through section by section if you would like, but that is the, the gist of the bill. Okay. Do we have any questions? Senator Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Olette, I, I thank you for the presentation and, and I probably would be a good idea to go section by section, but I think I understand most of it. I, if you could help me out, I think uh, the Assemblywoman uh, was really good in, in letting us know that for the most part, the substantive changes are pretty much the second half, or I think it starts on section 18, where you start talking about the changes you want to make to the, to the program, the loan program, and to the repayment program. The rest of it is, is pretty much just language change so that we're all in conformity. And, I, I think I understood that, and I, 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 I caught on real quick when we, stopped, when we started talking about the Mariana Islands, and we're not going to call them that anymore, and we're going to call it the you know, South Pacific Islands area. Yes. Um, but in, in 18, if you can just kind of run through that, I wanted to make sure, because that, is that the, the section that talks mostly about the 25% loan as opposed to the 75% portion of it? Um, Jennifer Ouellette for the record. So section 14 is the one that talks about eliminating that 25% loan component. Section 18, um, what that does is, so the requirements for both of the programs that we administer are identical in terms of our keeping track of people's employment commitments, having them keep us up to date on where they're living, where they're working, and the way that the statue was worded, because the program started at different times, um, it was very confusing to follow. So section 18 actually updates that old terminology and clarifies the requirements in one place for both programs so that someone who isn't a lay person and hasn't been studying our, our statute can actually read that and see what is required of them. Um, Section 18 also strikes languages for accounts prior to 1985, which those are no longer on our books, thank goodness, and um, that is, is not needed. So um, 
And then section 18 also allows the commission to set penalties for not completing the employment requirement. We have one penalty for one program and no penalty for another program. So we're, we're trying to keep things consistent between both programs and move what we can into regulations so that we can update it regularly with public input. That was, thank you, Ms. Ollett. That was very, very good. Thank you. I clarified a lot as I was reading through it because I wanted to make sure that I, I saw 18 and was wondering how it uh, uh, played out. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Just for the record, um, the bell is ringing because we're going to go to, as to, uh, um, soon as we finish here, we'll go down. But um, so we're going to take a recess at some point here. So any other questions? Okay, thank you. Let's go to those wishing to give uh, testimony and support. Anybody here in the, in the room? I don't see anybody. Let's go online. Anybody wishing to give uh, testimony and support? Thank you, Chair. If you'd like to testify in support on AB 247, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. Let's go to those wishing to give testimony in opposition. Anybody here in the room? Nobody coming forward. Let's go um, to online. If you would like to testify in opposition on AB 247, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Um, let's go to anyone wishing to give testimony in neutral. Nobody here in the in the in the room. Let's go online. If you would like to testify in neutral on AB two four seven, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Sure, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Okay. Any final comments? We'll close the testimony on on the on the bill. Uh, uh, Assemblywoman Tolls, any final comments? Okay. So we'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB two forty seven. Um, and I don't think we have time to no we don't we are we are going to go in recess um, we are going to go down to floor take care of some business down there as you all know this is that time of um, of this session Okay, um, so with that, um, we are going, uh, and uh, so I don't know how long that will be. Um, as you know, we're in that hurry up and wait mode type of a thing, so I apologize ahead of time, And uh, um, but uh, we've got to make sure we keep all the bills moving. So we're going to be in recess until after um, floor, which we will then come back to the floor, or after the floor session, we will come back here. So we are in a, we are, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a little while because we've got the things that we have to do. So with that, we are in a recess.